Would you be willing to die for a cause you really believe in? Up until recently, I used to live in a neighborhood where many people actually would give their lives for their cause. And in this video, I'm gonna show you why looking at their stories and mindset offers compelling raw material to build a case for Christ's resurrection. Hi, my name is Lucas and welcome to my channel, which challenges skeptics, strengthens believers and creates a space for awesome discussions about God. So up until a year ago, we used to live in a Muslim neighborhood in the very center of Beirut. If you were to walk the streets of that neighborhood, there is one thing you couldn't miss noticing. Posters depicting young men in camouflage at nearly every corner with their names written in Arabic at the bottom of the picture, always preceded by the term a shaheed. A shaheed means the martyr and so these pictures are put up in honor of the young men from that area who have recently died while fighting in Syria with Hezbollah, the powerful Lebanese Shiite militia. Our 20-year-old neighbor in our previous apartment, Muhammad, got dangerously close to having his picture put up on one of our street corners, as his parents sent him off to fight in Syria. His mom said to my wife, it would be an honor for us if he dies as a martyr in battle. Now I am glad this didn't happen. Instead, Muhammad came back around a month later with his arm in a cast as he was merely shot at. Now, you might simply want to write off as insane those who are ready to die for a cause. Sure, it's possible some of those martyrs from my old neighborhood were mentally unstable. Nevertheless, to brush aside all martyrdom as the result of people being out of their mind is to miss something vital. The readiness to die for a cause is rooted in the martyr's sincerity and conviction that this cause is of ultimate significance. Or to put it the other way around, people don't sacrifice themselves for things they don't consider to be real and important. All of this is key when you think about the emergence of Christianity 2000 years ago. From the New Testament, we learn that shortly after Jesus died, the apostles started going around the Mediterranean world proclaiming that Jesus is Savior because he rose from the dead. Furthermore, the New Testament, as well as other extra-biblical writings from the 1st through to the 4th century, tell us that at least some of the apostles were martyred for proclaiming Christ as the risen Lord. Now, when studying the past, historians ascribe levels of probabilities to the events they investigate. That's what Sean McDowell has done in his PhD, in which he studied the historical evidence for the fate of every single one of the 14 apostles featured in the New Testament. What he has found can be summarized as follows. One of the apostles, John, is improbable to have undergone martyrdom. For seven of them, martyrdom and non-martyrdom are equally plausible, or 50-50, given the evidence we have. McDowell deems the martyrdom of two apostles more probable than not, so not 50-50, but one may say 51 to 49. The martyrdom of one apostle, James the brother of Jesus, is described as very probably true, so maybe around 80 to 85 percent. Finally, McDowell's study finds that the remaining three apostles must have died as martyrs with the highest possible probability, so somewhere around 95 percent. One of them was James, the son of Zebedee, and the other two were Peter and Paul. A strand of solid historical evidence suggests that Peter was crucified while Paul was beheaded as both of them met their fate in Rome under the reign of Nero. As is the case with my neighbors who gave their lives in battle for Shia Islam, it is safe to say that the apostles thought of their belief in the risen Jesus as being a matter of ultimate truth and significance. In other words, they were serious about what they proclaimed. Of course, this in itself doesn't render their faith true, just as the martyrdom of my Shiite neighbors doesn't in itself render Shia Islam true. Yet, there is one important distinction between the martyred apostles and my martyred neighbors. The latter didn't actually witness the events 1400 years ago which gave rise to the faith they died for. The former, on the other hand, were themselves present in Jerusalem 2000 years ago when Jesus' grave was found empty and they themselves experienced what they interpreted as the risen Christ appearing to them. Thus, what makes the case of the apostles different from that of my neighbors is that the apostles endured martyrdom for something they actually knew to be either true or false, that is, the claim that Jesus rose from the dead. 
My neighbors, on the other hand, died for something they could only believe to be either true or false. That is, the claim that Muhammad is God's final messenger and the Quran God's final revelation. Now, why is this compelling evidence for the historicity of Christ's resurrection? It's because no one dies for what they know to be a lie. I mean, would you be willing to die for something you, you knew for a fact to be wrong? For example, would you die for the idea that planet Earth is a cube? I guess not. So imagine Peter and Paul conversing somewhere along the lines of, hey, let's try and make people in Rome believe that Jesus rose from the dead. It will probably get us executed, but so what? This doesn't make any sense. You may object that the evidence of martyrdom is not conclusive for all the apostles. True, but let's not forget that all of them were at least ready to endure suffering and face death because of what they believed about Jesus. And so, the question is, why would you even bother to face all that trouble for a fabricated story you know to be wrong? So, the martyrdom of Peter and Paul, as well as the readiness of all the apostles to die for their faith in the risen Christ, is what I would call a stubborn fact for those rejecting the historicity of the resurrection. Again, none of this proves Christianity right. It shows, however, that the apostles had first-hand knowledge about something which changed their lives to the point of them being ready to lay it down. According to them, that something was the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And so, the question is, why shouldn't we take them at their word? By the way, the Gospel authors claimed that women were the key witnesses of the resurrection, even though in their day and age, no testimony that was based on the word of women was considered to be reliable. If you wonder why this makes for yet another compelling case for the resur resurrection of Jesus, check out this video. Don't forget to subscribe, thank you for watching and see you over there.